In this week's drive, we take a microscopic journey through Formula One, see the crowning of two world champions again, put one heavy American at each end of a rope, and see an Austrian reign in Spain. All this and more in this week's Drive. We start this week with a look at some of the electronic technology that makes Formula One the pinnacle of motorsport. In particular, we look at drive-by-wire, a feature pioneered by the aerospace industry. Space is limited and the driver takes up much of it, so space and weight is saved everywhere. Even the humble accelerator cable is gone. The accelerator pedal position is recorded electronically and then transmitted to a hydraulic system which opens or closes the throttle valve. However, the point is that it is possible to control and especially set everything much more precisely so you can carry out the tuning of the engine very, very specifically, just as the driver wants it. This fly-by-wire technology is now simply called by-wire, where a computer adds functionality. But the drivers need to get used to it. There's no feedback through the controls. I started out with an accelerator cable. The only thing you had to watch out for was that the pedal should feel the same, and you can set that by installing resistors. Other than that, it has no problem. In addition, the by-wire system doesn't need to be linear. A driver will need finer control in the final quarter of the throttle, so this can be spread across three quarters of the pedal's travel if he wants it. Electronic driver aids like launch control and traction control are controversial. Authorities and minor teams want them banned. Major teams have the resources to fine-tune them. Maneuvers like this one are now part of every race, but in the past, without traction control, feeding in too much power or being on the dirty part of the track could have ended in disaster. Electronics won't save every situation, but they let drivers stay closer to the limits. Sensors in the steering and the pedal calculate the movements and pressure points and then transfer them to the electronic brain of the car, the so-called black box. Unlike its aircraft equivalent, this is an onboard computer, not just a recording device. It receives a steady flow of data from about 70 sensors all over the car. They collect information about acceleration, centrifugal force and tilt angles, reams of engine data and the rotation speed of each wheel. This data used to be downloaded to the team's computers every time the car passed the pits, but the system, known as telemetry, was recently banned. Data is processed on board to determine the point at which the car starts to lose grip and the car drops power slightly. If the driver gets into the throttle too hard, the electronics either restrict the engine's fuel flow, retards the timing, or limits the engine's air intake to soften the power delivery. The idea is to regain grip without losing momentum. Similar systems, such as driving stability programs like the ESP system on this BMW, help to improve safety on road cars if the car begins to skid. By-wire technology is arriving on increasingly humble road cars. The by-wire technology is already being used today for shifting gear and accelerating. Researchers are working on the brakes. Brake by-wire could provide a number of advantages, such as shorter braking distances due to the faster response time of the brake. However, more work is still needed on the reliability and the affordability of these systems, which are crucial factors in terms of mass production. Computers in cars turn up in strange places. This one's under the carpet. Many modern cars now have more computing power on board than was needed to put Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon. Research into braking by wire would see separate brakes on each wheel with no vulnerable brake hoses good for safety and individual wheel control. Curiously, changes in Formula One rules intended to cut costs for teams have seen the banning of a basic safety feature which is standard in virtually every new road car, ABS or anti-lock brakes. Tim Newton, who heads up the Williams test team, explains why. With Formula One cars, it became quite clever. Um, it would operate more of the rear brakes 
when the car was going at a faster speed. And as the car was at a slower speed, it would operate less of the rear brake. Um, but also it became almost full ABS. It could tell if the wheels were going to lock and they decided that this was getting too advanced and so they've banned it. The car now has a simpler braking system than almost every road car. But with all the electronics, it's still up to the driver to get the car home safely, whether it's to the checkered flag or the driveway at home. NASCAR's latest round was surrounded by on- and off-track animosity. Kurt Busch bumped past Jimmy Spencer for his first career victory 16 months ago, and the feud blew up again last week when Busch tried to run Spencer off the track. Spencer punched him in the face and was suspended. Busch was put on probation. Once the race started, there was plenty of bumping and a record 20 yellow flags. 88 laps in, Rusty Wallace was injured when he crashed with Michael Waltrip and was taken to hospital. Wallace was treated and released later in the evening after a negative CT scan, suffering bruised ribs and a badly bitten tongue. Mark Martin had a competitive car, leading and gambling on pit strategy to win. He stopped for a quick splash of fuel and pulled away with a catch can still on the car. A penalty dropped him back among some less experienced drivers where Johnny Sorter took him out of the race. Bush, riding a storm of controversy coming into the race, probably added Sterling Marlin to his growing list of enemies. Marlin was making a bid for his first win of the season and his first ever on his home track when Bush spun him out as he tried to pass him for second place on the 373rd lap. Jeff Gordon, third in the standings, the defending race winner and starting from pole, probably lost any hope of catching points leader Matt Kenseth when he crashed with 50 laps to go. He finished 24th, dropping to fifth in the standings. Kurt Busch kept his head high amid a flood of criticism from his competitors, raucous booing from the fans, and of course, the chipped tooth and swollen nose that Spencer gave him. Instead, he focused his skills on the job in hand, running away from Kevin Harvick to score his fourth win of the season and third in the last four races at Bristol. Bush didn't celebrate with the usual donuts, instead simply driving the number 97 Ford to Victory Lane, few smiles on his face. If he heard the thundering boos showered on him from the crowd of 160,000, he didn't show it. Kart racing was back in Canada at Montreal's Gilles Villeneuve circuit where Alex Tagliani was a surprise pole winner. Mario Dominguez left the track while trying to pass Sebastian Bourdais, but he managed to regain the track to finish fifth. Michel Jourdain passed Oriol Servia, the other front row starter, who had snatched the early lead and managed to hold off his attempts to regain the lead. Another near miss came at the hairpin as teammates Paul Tracy and Patrick Carpentier, running neck and neck, nearly took each other out. Bruno Gianquira also had problems at the hairpin and spun twice. The second time, he stalled his engine and lost a lap. Later, Tiago Montero slammed into the back of Ryan Hunter Ray, sending both drivers off the course. Meanwhile, Tugliani ran onto the grass trying to pass Paul Tracy and lost the position he'd had for a couple of seconds. Jimmy Vassa was pushing hard until his gearbox failed, putting him out two laps from the end. Finally, Jourdain took the checkered flag for his second career win. Sevilla was unable to mount a challenge as Tracy ran out of fuel at the final turn and coasted across the line to place sixth. NASCAR standings leader Ben Collins was on the front row for round seven of the Days of Thunder. Collins quickly moved around pole sitter Derek Hayes to take the lead, but almost immediately yellow flags came out and at the restart, Hayes reclaimed the lead. The complexion of the race changed dramatically on lap 24 when Hayes suddenly slowed and began to drop down the field as a plug lead came loose. As Hayes dropped back and the pack bunched up behind him, Anthony Swan sent Rob Speak into a spin on turn four which ended with a chev in the wall, narrowly missing a backhander along the way. The flag said there was oil on the track, so most drivers pitted for tyres. The 
yellow flag was out again on lap 49 following another pileup. Cacaldi hit Ian McKellar, sending another Chev into the wall, while Hayes was struck by Swan as the Irishman defended his position. The McDonald's Pontiac speared into the inside wall, shedding a wheel, and in the resulting chaos, Alejandro Linche and Swan spun, with Tony King only just avoiding hitting the Lego Chevrolet. After the carnage, the race continued without too much incident, and Verges was able to fend off his pursuers to take the chequered flag. Rayfelt finished second, and White third. At the start of the second race, round eight, Verges took the lead from White, Cacaldi, and Collins. Linche brought out the second and final yellow flag of the second race when he lost downforce and spun into turn four and hit the wall on lap 31. He did a neat job of avoiding everyone else parking on the infield grass. Collins cruised ahead and set the fastest lap on his way to his second win of the season. Behind him, a great battle between Proctor, Rayfelt, and Richardson saw them separated by six tenths of a second at the flag. At the Nitro Olympics drag race meeting at Hockenheim's quarter mile track, Peter Beck of Switzerland won a close top fuel final, beating Tommy Muller of Sweden. Rule Kudam of the Netherlands beat Peter Bosser of Switzerland in the top fuel bike final to become European champion. Urs Urbacher won the top methanol funny car final by default in the relatively relaxed solo run when his opponent, Nicholas Andersson of Sweden, couldn't make it to the start line. He'd already clinched the championship. It's really great. We are European champion after the last round and uh, now the final. We win the final here in Germany. It's a really nice track, really nice spectators. My whole family is here and it's really fun to win this race. Peter Schuffer of Germany won the top methanol dragster final from David Wilson of Great Britain. Wilson's best time is a 5.44, fractionally quicker than Schuffer's personal best of 5.48 seconds. Roger Pettersson of Sweden won the Pro Stock Bike Final from Anders Larsen of Sweden, who shut his bike down when he anticipated the Christmas tree and plucked a cherry, triggering the red light for a jump start. Today on Sunday we did the track record and we take the victory. I'm pretty pleased with that. Sweden's Michael Malmgren was a clear winner in the Pro Stock Car Final from countryman Magnus Hansen with a leisurely 7.16-second pass at 314 kilometers an hour to claim this year's championship. His quickest pass was two years ago, a 6.94 at 320, the European record set in his 500 cubic inch Chev Camaro. <laughs> yeah, we did it, right. <laughs> The penultimate round of the motocross season, the Grand Prix of the Czech Republic, took place in Loket and saw two world champions crowned. In the 125 race, Kawasaki rider Mikhail Maschio led into the first corner, but MXGP standings leader Stefan Everts bounced back from an uncharacteristically poor start and was soon challenging for the lead. First, the Belgian powered past Alessio Chiodo and closed in on Maschio, the reigning world champion. Everts missed the first three races of the season, but powered past the Frenchman and pushed on for his sixth consecutive 1-2-5 victory. Maschio was also passed by New Zealander Ben Townley in the closing stages and finished third ahead of Andrea Bartolini. But there'd be no catching Everts, who claimed his seventh 1-2-5 GP win of the season, and Everts would soon be back on the track for the MX GP race. Had he raced in Spain, the Netherlands and Germany, Everts would surely be ahead of Steve Ramon in the title standings. Mathematically, he can still win it. The premier motocross GP class was over for some almost before it started.
Initially, Frenchman Vincent Turpin led, but it wouldn't last. Pretty soon, the Everts steamroller cruised past and the Yamaha rider claimed his now customary position at the head of the field. Everts faced stiff competition from fellow Belgian Joel Smets, but Smets crashed while landing from a jump and promptly tangled with Gordon Crockard. These rare mistakes from Smets would effectively hand Everts the title. He crossed the line for his eighth consecutive MXGP victory ahead of Monique Bavutz. It's been a long way to win the seven titles. Very long way. And I want to dedicate it to my uncle. I wish he would be here, but, but also thank you very much to the team, to all of my sponsors and also my fans. Smets ended up in a lowly 10th place, handing Everts an unbeatable lead and as a result, the 2003 MXGP title. This was his 69th career win, his 15th of the year, and it gave him a record 7th world championship. But Smets would make up for the disappointment of missing out on the MXGP title in the 650cc race. Javier Garcia Vico of Spain moved into the lead after passing Belgian Cedric Malot. Vico has 10 trophies this year, eight of them for coming second. Honda rider Malot then found Smets closing in on his rear mudguard and relinquished second place moments later. Garcia Vico was Smets's only rival for the 650 title going into the race, but when Smets passed him for first place, the Spaniards' title hopes came to an end. Make that nine second place cups for Vico. Smets clinched his 10th victory from the season's 11 races, taking the 650 title in the process. It was the eighth time this year that the KTM duo have scored a podium 1-2. Malot recorded his seventh top three result. At 34 years of age, Smets becomes the oldest world champion in motocross history, taking his fifth career title. The last race of the season is the Grand Prix of France. After the nightmare of last Saturday, the organizers of this Saturday's rerun Scandinavian Speedway Grand Prix had to put on a real show. Then the recently laid track proved too dangerous with the riders refusing to race after the opening heats. They must have feared the worst when the Ullevi Stadium track in Gutenberg needed a thorough grading this time round after just two heats. But despite the odd mishap, this proved to be a much better surface. Denmark's Bjarne Pedersen appeared to be pushing just a little too hard coming into the finish of the 11th heat. Winded, he lay in the mud for a while but suffered no serious injuries. Tony Ricardson and Nicky Pedersen led coming into the sixth event of the World Championship. Both, though, were to be disappointed in Gutenberg. Aiming for his sixth World Championship, the Swede was out at the end of Heat 17 with just six points for his efforts. The home crowd had hoped for better from the multiple world champion. Pedersen managed just one point more. Riding as number 12 with the yellow helmet, he reached Heat 22 but was to go no further. Last in the heat, he was eliminated, but he is still joint leader in the championship, one point ahead of Rickardson. By the end of the event, the Dane had been joined at the top of the world standings by Lee Adams, who finished third in a final dominated by Australians. Britain's Scott Nichols finished second with Ryan Sullivan, another Aussie, coming home in front and the first rider this year to win two rounds. Sullivan has had a disappointing season, his world title hopes ruined by a succession of injuries. And 17 points adrift, he says he's not a title contender. Adams and Pedersen lead on 96 points. With three events left, it's building up to be a great climax to the season. The one-make BMW Boxer Cup round at Barcelona's Catalunya circuit saw last year's winner, Austrian Thomas Hinterreiter, start from pole position in scorching hot weather. VIP guest riders in this round included ESPN commentator and former 250 Grand Prix place-getter Jürgen Fuchs and American Greg White, a Speed Channel commentator with Formula Extreme experience. Hinterreiter was passed by a fast-starting Marcus Barth, but within seconds, Italian Roberto Panici jumped into the lead as the 39-strong field made it safely through the first few turns. He gradually extended his lead, with Hinterreiter holding second most of the time, as Austrian Andy Hoffman, Bath, Englishman Richard Cooper, Fernando Cristobal and Belgium's Sebastian Legrel dueled for the last podium place. 
Panishi seemed to have it all in the bag, with Hinterreiter unable to claw back the difference. But on the 10th lap, things would change in the chasing pack. Local rider Cristobal ran wide on an exit, came back onto the track with dirt on his tires, fought a 100-meter weave, and ended up crashing off into the trackside sandpit. He walked away, taking local hopes for a win with him. Panici opened up a three-second lead over Hinterreiter, with Legrel appearing at the front of the chasing pack. With two wins and a second in the first four rounds, Panici was leading the championship and was looking good for a third win. Then, suddenly, Panici was off the track and nearly over the wall, his high-climbing bike giving the marshals a headache. His crash promoted Hinterreiter back up into the lead, and as the Austrian opened up a gap, Bath, Legrel, Hoffman and Cooper scrapped over second place. Hoffman had crashed in practice and broken his ankle, so he was racing with pain-killing injections. It's still up there and it's not coming down. Italian Mauro Pellegrini had a quick trip from the track to the beach, although his bike is going to need more than cosmetic surgery. Hinterreiter wasn't troubled in his run to the line, with the multinational battle for second going on across every meter of the 15 laps. Taking his second win in a row in Spain, Hinterreiter moves up to equal fourth with Marcus Barth in the championship. The Grell was second in the race from Hoffman, who now leads the title, Barth and Cooper. My start wasn't as good as Panici's. When he took over the lead, I had room to speed up as well. And when there was a gap, I tried to close it. Step by step it worked until Panici made a mistake and crashed. That was my chance to take the lead and open up a gap on the opposition. The Rock Crawler Association of America held its first women's rock crawling championship in the rough ground in Utah. The rock crawlers use 4x4 vehicles that have been upgraded to handle the huge boulders with monster tires and huge ground clearances. The course is planned to test driving finesse, mechanical grip and chassis articulation. The 13 women competitors, some seasoned veterans and others crawling for the first time, drove carefully to clear the obstacles, getting across with only a little difficulty. Even when one of the drivers did overestimate her vehicle's ability, her co-driver's concern was obvious. Eventually, Julie Mallow and her super-modified truck were the winners, with her husband Jeff acting as spotter. <laughs> Kelly Clifford crawled to first place in the modified stock class. So, on the road or off it, so you stay in the know and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.